very serious issues. And now we're talking about uh, a textbook, an economics te textbook, and people seem to be interested in this at least as much as it seems, which is not ob uh, ob objective, but uh, a lot in this discussion um, in these times, which means that either it's so sort of uh, COVID fatigue uh, that people may be interested in, in other things, or that people are in a very optimistic mood and expecting that there will be times after COVID and then we will come back to some uh, very fundamental questions. And then it's uh, a lot of what we are going to talk about and discuss is about the question of government and markets. And that's in the midst also of, of COVID policies. And that's something we will, uh, we will expect or we expect from the new American president who will um, start tomorrow with a lot of intervention, uh, government intervention policies and so on. So, I mean, we're in the midst of it anyway. And um, I want to ask Peter Bofinger to start. Um, and the, the cause or the reason for this session is that Peter has started to Twitter to, uh, in, in, in late uh, last year and had an enormous uh, reaction on some tweets about uh, Greg Mankiw's uh, famous and, and bestseller economics textbooks. So this has created a lot of uh, feedback and we wanted to have a discussion on that. And we are very honored to have you, Peter and Greg uh, to react. And then afterwards, Rüdiger and Anna will present you briefly afterwards. So Peter, if you can start and um, tell us what are your main critiques? Yeah, thank you very much, Thomas, and for New Economy for organizing this debate on my Twitter series on Greg Mankiw's books. I will now share my screen with you. Oops. So, where is it? One moment. So, can you all see it? This is okay. Can you see it? Okay, great. So, how did the whole thing start? It started by an event, the economy of Francesco initiated by Pope Francis on teaching and education. And I was asked for this event to give a presentation on economic education. And after the event, I thought, why not use some of the charts for Twitter? And the response was really astonishing. It was a huge uh, feedback from, from many, many people, many, many likes. And so this encouraged me to make a whole series out of it. And in the end also to write some explanations to this, which I published in German, in Macronome and in English um, on the INET blog. So why is teaching so important? I think it's quite obvious. I think introductory textbooks shape the mindset of students. And there's a saying, there's no second chance to make a first impression. I think if you all think back to when we started studying economics, I think these first textbooks, the first introductory lectures really shape our thinking on economics. And of course, textbooks are also relevant in the broader context. Authors on the history of economic thought like Colander and Landreth speak about textbook revolutions, which are an important element of scientific revolutions. And why is Greg Mankiw's book relevant? Well, it's, to my knowledge, the world's best-selling textbook uh, in economics. So what is wrong uh, with the presentation of economics in these textbooks? I want to discuss three points in this very short pres uh, presentation now. In my view, the textbook provide a flaw or at least flawed or at least biased presentation of the role of government in the economic system. And, it really reminds me of the statement by Ronald Reagan, government is not the solution to our problem, government is the problem. Second, the textbooks give a flawed presentation of the role of the financial system. And finally, but I will address this only very shortly, they also present Keynesian theory in a way, way that is at least confusing. Let me start with the role of the government. I'm reading the principles textbook, one could ask, does the market need the government at all? In principle seven, the book says, government can sometimes improve market outcomes. And then it says, the invisible hand does not ensure that everyone has sufficient food, decent clothing and adequate health care. But what is the consequence of this? The textbook says, this inequality may 
depending on one's political philosophy, call for government intervention, but not necessarily. And I would prefer introduction uh, to economics, uh, which follows the classification by Richard Musgrave in his very famous books on public finance. And Musgrave differentiates between the distribution function, the allocation function, and the stabilization function of the government. I think that's a very systematic way to address the role of government uh, in a market economy. And following this classification, uh, one can talk about distributional policies. And here, the reader of the textbook is presented with principle one, which says people face trade-offs. And uh, the textbook then says, yes, when government redistributes income from the rich to the poor, it re reduces the reward for working hard. And then it concludes, when the government tries to cut the economic pie in more equal slices, the pie gets smaller. I would say this is definitely not in line with the evidence if you look at the Scandinavian states with a very comprehensive distributional system, one can definitely not say that the pie is small in these countries. These are very efficient economies. So um, the idea that distributional policies always have a negative effect um, on uh, economic performance is definitely not in line with the evidence. And then again, uh, under the label of distributional policies, the textbook says minimum wages cause unemployment. The reader is presented with this chart, which is a very simple uh, market description. But of, and from this chart follows, of course, that if you have a minimum wage, it causes unemployment. But what the chart does not say, and what the book also does not say, this result depends on the assumption that you have perfect competition on the side of labor demand. As soon as you assume that labor demand is not, is not uh, a perfect competition, you can show that you can introduce a minimum wage without causing unemployment. And that's exactly what we've experienced in Germany after the introduction of the minimum wage. There were no significant effects on employment. And there's also huge empirical evidence which shows that definitely minimum wages do not always cause unemployment. Going on to the allocative, allocative role of the government, uh, the reader uh, is uh, presented the effects of budget deficits. And here, uh, if the chart on the left hand side shows, whenever the government runs a deficit, national saving is reduced, investment falls, and there's less economic growth. So government investment financed by government deficits are always a bad thing. But this rests on the implicit assumption that the government uses the funds for consumption and not for investment. If you assume that government uses deficit for public investment, you come to the chart on the right hand side, uh, where you can see that the investment schedule shifts to the right and you have more investment and more growth. So you can see by very simple changes in the assumptions get completely different results. And of course, you get also completely uh, different policy implications. One assumption means government deficits are always bad. The other assumption means government deficits can, can have positive effects. If you now come to the stabilization role of the government, um, uh, Mencius principle number 10 says, society faces a short run trade-off between inflation and unemployment. So the idea is, Whenever you stimulate the economy to reduce unemployment, you have negative side effects uh, on, if, on inflation. But this, again, depends on the assumption. If you assume that the economy is confronted with a negative demand shock, which means that inflation goes down, is below the inflation target, which means that you have a negative output gap, which creates unemployment. If in this situation, you follow expansionary fiscal or monetary policies, inflation goes back to its target value and you reduce unemployment without any trade-off. Finally, you can ask as a reader of the Mencke book, do we need stabilization policies at all? Isn't the economic system by itself stabilizing? And uh, here I show you a chart from the macroeconomic textbook, which describes a situation where the economy is hit by a negative demand shock. So the economy moves from point A to point B. Uh, 
But then the book says, well, when the price level falls, the economy can recover, can come back to full employment. But what is a fall in the price level is nothing else but deflation. And so it's a very strange idea that deflation is a mechanism that helps to restore full employment. It's definitely at odds with historical uh, experience with deflation. And um, I think on a more theoretical side, the problem of this approach is that it does not take into account the problem of a zero lower bound, which is of course of a major relevance uh, when an economy is confronted with deflation. So far, the presentations on the role of government and what I, what I want to say with this is that the role of the government is not really evident and it's, it's more that the government is disturbing uh, the economic process than it, it is a solution to economic problems which face a country. Let me shortly address the role of the financial system, especially banks here. Uh, the textbooks of MenQ uh, are following uh, the loanable funds model in, in most parts uh, where the banks are simple, in the, in simple intermediaries between savers and investors. So the savers generate funds and the banks collect the funds and then the funds are uh, distributed to investors. So in a nutshell, as Menke says it, banks collect deposits. But we all know, at least since the financial crisis, that this is not a very useful description of reality. We know that banks can create deposits. They do not need any savings or saving from the private household to create deposits. And this ability to create deposits out of nothing is exactly what makes the financial system so unstable. So the whole financial crisis uh, was caused by this ability of banks to create, to create funds out of nothing, not requiring any collection from funds from, from savers. And I think if a student tries to learn something about the economy, it's really important, especially after the experience with the financial crisis that the role of banks is described in an adequate way. Uh, I want to add that in the textbook, Menke also describes uh, the mechanics of the uh, money, uh, money multiplier, uh, which assumes that bank can create deposits, but uh, we all know that this money multiplier is really a caricature of the credit creation process and not an adequate description of what really happens in the financial system. So let me come to the end. Very sharp remark on Keynesian theory. Um, uh, in, the, in the textbook, uh, the so-called Keynesian cross is presented and Menke says, this is the simplest interpretation of Keynes theory. And uh, in the textbook, you find the chart on the left-hand side, which shows uh, two lines, actual expenditure, planned expenditure, and if I was a student, I would ask, what a strange theory about actual and planned expenditure. What kind of theory is this? And um, here you only have to change the interpretation to make it, make it a useful uh, presentation. Um, the 45 degree line is not actual expenditure. It's a shorter and aggregate supply, which in the Keynesian model is demand determined and the other line is aggregate demand. And then it becomes quite a nice story. You have Keynesian theory, which relates aggregate supply, aggregate demand, and the special feature of Keynesian theory is that aggregate supply is demand determined in the short run. So, so far this very short uh, presentation, Thomas only gave me 12 minutes or 15 minutes and I'm close to my time budget. I hope that I could show you that all these uh, tweets uh, cover relevant topics, topics that are relevant for the understanding of the role of the government, that are relevant for an understanding of the role and the function of the financial system, that are also relevant to get an idea of Keynesian theory. Let me end by saying that I think teaching is really matter, matters, teaching is really relevant, and I'm very happy that we have this, this debate today um, on teaching because I think in the daily academic business, uh, the importance of teaching and textbooks is underrated. You do not get any scores in academic rankings if you write textbooks, which require a huge input of time. And I think many 
professors are also not very fond of, of teaching. So teaching deserves more importance, more importance deserves, deserves uh, more, um, more focus. And I think what we do today here is, is a start in the right directions. I want to end by presenting examples for what I think are modern approaches. One is the core team project, which has a textbook on economics, which you can download um, from the internet without any cost. The other is my own textbook, which is only in German, which is not free of charge, but I think I, in this textbook I try to present uh, the economy in the way that I have sketched uh, in this uh, last 15 minutes. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Peter, um, for this pre presentation. And for all who want to know more about it, uh, we will share the, the links to uh, uh, a, long, a somewhat longer uh, article about um, the main points and some others, um, and that may be uh, consulted. So I would like um, to hand over to, to Greg. And as I said, we are very honored to have you um, and to have the opportunity to directly discuss this with uh, uh, the author of these books and a professor of Harvard at Harvard University and former head of the Council of Economic Advisors under George W. Bush. Um, brilliant. So please, um, what are you thinking about what Peter has uh, developed in the last couple of minutes? Well, uh, thank you, uh, Thomas, for uh, including me. Um, I really appreciate being a part of this panel. Uh, originally, I just signed up to be a member of the audience. And they noticed my name there and they said, oh, as long as you're going to be coming to listen, why don't you speak for a few minutes? So I'm perfectly happy. To do that. And let me thank uh, Peter Bofinger uh, for taking the time uh, to comment on my books. I, I revise them every three years. And I'm always looking for ways uh, to improve them. So whenever anybody wants to offer me feedback, I'm always uh, eager to listen and try to figure out ways I can, I can make them better. Um, let me start off with one thing that we completely agree on. Peter says in his slides, he says, in the daily business of academic economists, the importance of teaching in textbooks is underrated. And I 100% agree with that. Um, it, it, well, as, as teachers, we educate the next generation of voters. And I think that's one of the most important jobs that economists have, economics professors have. Uh, and I'm delighted that I could help play a, a small, small role in that through my, through my textbooks. Now I can't, I don't have the time to respond to everything um, uh, Peter said. The, there's a lot of things I disagree with. I mean, my own general view is that a lot of what I'm presenting is very much mainstream e economics. So for example, Peter um, uh, takes the example of inequality where I talk about there's a trade-off between um, efficiency and, and equality, and he takes accept exception to that. Um, but I think this is really a very old idea that pervades the economics literature. So you think of Arthur Open's old book, Equality and Efficiency, the big trade-off. That's certainly an example of, of that, that trade-off being prominent in the pu public policy debate. If you think of the classic Murley's model for which he won the Nobel Prize, that's a model about designing an optimal tax system. That's basically a model that formalizes this trade-off between equality um, and efficiency. So I think what I, the way I'm presenting it is really is very much consistent with uh, sort of the mainstream views. Similarly, when I talk about the trade-off between inflation and unemployment, I think it's also very consistent with mainstream views. Let me quote Jar Akerlof. Uh, he said, quote, probably the, most, the single most important macroeconomic relationship is the Phillips curve. Uh, and I agree with that. I think it's a very important macroeconomic relationship. And what I, I, what I present, when I present the Phillips curve and the trade off between inflation and unemployment, it's, it's very consistent with the views that have been expressed over the years by great economists like Paul Samuelson and Robert Solo and Milton Friedman, um, who, have, who have written on it. And similarly, in Keynesian theory more generally, what I present is very traditional aggregate demand, aggregate supply, ISLM models along, along the lines of Hicks. Um, I, in, my, in my intermediate book, I then go on to what's sort of a more modern. Uh, dynamic model, which is just sort of a baby version of a DSGE model with the Taylor rules um, to governing monetary policy. Um, and I think what, when Peter sort of talks about certain things, I say like deflation can, can be stabilizing. What's well, actually true in the context of certain models, and like the ISLM model, I'm ex I explained that. I then go on and later in the book and explain that the deflation may be destabilizing. And if you look at the this discussion of the Great Depression, you'll see there are big discussion of the destabilizing effects of deflation. Uh, and there's a discussion of the zero lower bound um, as well. What I'd like to do is not spend time arguing about these specific things where I disagree with Peter, but I'd like to spend my few minutes uh, emphasizing the big picture and my basic philosophy of teaching, 
uh, and teaching uh, undergraduates in particular. I view the instructor and the textbook author is, is, is included in this as well. The instructor is really an ambassador for the economics profession. And the goal is not to represent your own views of how the economy works, but you're really there to represent the broad consensus of the economics profession. Um, and, and, and as such, you probably, once you, as an instructor, you probably should uh, suppress your idiosyncrasies. So if you have a view that's very different from the mainstream, you, you, the students aren't there to learn your idiosyncratic view. They're really there to learn what most economists think. So what I try to present to the undergraduates is the summary of what most economists think about the issue uh, at hand. And that doesn't mean suppressing your idiosyncrasies, which is often hard to do. Because people are usually proud of their idiosyncrasies. Um, but, but, but I think it's a responsible thing to do is to, to do that. So to give you an example, when I, when I, when I had to do a, a suppress my idiosyncrasies, when the first edition of my intermediate macro book came out in around 91, I think it was, I had a whole chapter on real business cycle theory. People who read my academic work knew I was a critic of real business cycle theory, didn't think, didn't think it held much water, but there was a large number of economists who took real business cycle theory quite seriously then. And I felt it was incumbent upon me as a textbook author to take it seriously and explain it. Now, over time, I think real business cycle theory has faded from the academic uh, mainstream. I think very few people are adherents to it today. So the coverage of real business cycle theory diminished in my textbook. And now it's, it's got to barely mention in the new edition. But it, that was an example where I, I had to say, look, I have to be honest with this the students that I don't, my views aren't necessarily the mainstream's views and my, my um, the role as an instructor and the textbook author was to try to present the mainstream view as, as, as honestly and in a balanced way as I can. Now, my view of Peter Bofinger's critique of my books is he's really, what he, what he, I don't think what he's saying is I'm failing to do a good job of representing the economic mainstream. I think really what he's really saying is he doesn't really like the, the main, economic mainstream very much, and he's trying to introduce a more heterodox um, uh, alternative. And uh, let me sort of give you three pieces of evidence why I, I, I say that. First, I think there's, there's no doubt that my books meet the market test. I mean, I've, I've introduced economics books and an intermediate book. Um, they're both the best sellers for their, their markets. I think they're selling twice what the number two book does in those markets. Um, in Eng I sell something like a quarter of a million books a year in English. And I don't know the number in translation, but I'm guessing quite a large number since there's about 20 translations. So most there's a lot of instructors out there who think I'm doing a pretty good job re representing um, the economic mainstream. Because if they didn't, they'd switch to other books. My second, second piece of evidence is that if you look at the main competitors to my books, they don't really teach an economics that's very different from mine. In the, in the introductory market, the main competitors, um, I think the, the, the next three books in sales after mine are a book by um, Glenn Hubbard and Tony O'Brien, a book by an older, very old book, still in, updated many times, originally by um, Campbell McConnell. Now I think it's McConnell, Brew and Flynn. Um, Ms. Campbell McConnell's died some years ago. And the, and the book by uh, Krugman and Wells. Those, those are, I think, the two, three, and four books in some order. I don't know which. Um, and if you look at the economics that, that taught those books, I don't think it's fundamentally very different from what's taught in my books. I think if, if, one of the, if, if the Hubbard book suddenly became the number one book, I think Peter could write a very similar article about the Hubbard book um, that, that, he, that, that he wrote about my book. And the third piece of evidence that what Peter is really criticizing is not me in my books, but rather the economic mainstream, is what is Peter's own, own views. Now, I, didn't, I, I don't know Peter well. In fact, I don't think we've ever met, to, to, to my knowledge. Um, but I did look him up a little bit in preparation for this. And here's, and this is not the perfect source, but it's, it's the best I could find. I looked up his, his entry in Wikipedia. And this is what it said. I'm going to quote from Wikipedia. It says, Bofinger is, quote, a member of Germany's Council of Economic Experts, or became one in 2004. He has in the past oftentimes disagreed with the council's conclusions. Between 2012 and 2017, he issued 26 of the council's 27 minority votes during that period. Now, that doesn't mean that Peter's wrong. It just that means that his, his views are not in the mainstream. He's, 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 he's heterodox in his views, which is fine. People are certainly free to have that opinion, and maybe he's even right, but it's clear that he is not, his views are, are sort of off the economic mainstream, and that really what he's criticizing my books for is not that they're, they're failing to present the economic mainstream well, rather he's saying he doesn't really believe what the economic mainstream believes. Now, let me sort of go back in time a little bit um, to when I was a student. I was a student in the 1970s. 
And uh, the leading economics textbook at the time was by Paul Samuelson. It's like one of the books that I learned from when I was a freshman uh, in college. Now, Paul Samuelson's uh, own politics were decidedly left of center, but that didn't uh, prevent him from being criticized by those even farther left. I remember finding at the time a two volume critique of the book called Anti Samuelson. It was published in 1977. It was actually condensed from the original four volume German edition. I don't know, for some reason, these critiques often come out of Germany, I guess. Um, it was written by Mark Linder, who's now a professor of labor law at the University of Iowa. And the, the book, Anti Samuelson, was aimed to provide a Marxian counterpoint to the standard economics of the day. Professor Linder focused on the Samuelson book, not because he thought it was particularly egregious, but because it was a prominent representation of the mainstream economic thought of the time. And I think what's going on here is obviously serving a similar role today. P Peter's critique is not really aimed at me and my books. It's aimed at the mainstream very broadly. And he's using me as a proxy. He's using me as a personification of the mainstream. And that is a perfectly fair thing to do because I am sort of a mainstream economist. And since I do sell a lot of books, uh, I, a lot of people are learning mainstream economics uh, from me. But if his critique is to be accepted, the implied result would not be that I just need to revise my books. Um, but really it's a major reorientation of the entire economics profession and how we teach and how we view the world. So that I really suspect is Peter's real goal. It's not really about MANQ, it's about uh, economics. And let me, um, with that, uh, stop there. Th thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you, thank you Greg. Um, I hand over directly to Rüdiger Bachmann, uh, who was accepted to, to comment on Peter's uh, remarks. Uh, he's from the University of Notre Dame in uh, Indiana. So please, Rüdiger, go ahead. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me, Thomas. Um, my original role as announced on Twitter was to defend the honor of Greg Mankiw. I'm very glad that I don't have to do that now because Greg did that himself. Uh, so um, uh, so that, that lifts a huge burden of me because uh, I don't think that's my job. Um, and let me also uh, start with a point of agreement with both of you in this, uh, by saying that I agree that indeed teaching is super important and that it is undervalued and underrated in our sort of reward systems in academic uh, economics. That's true for both Germany and the US and probably around the world, although I don't know the systems around the world. Um, let me preface my remarks and I'm gonna, uh, my remarks are going to be, and I have issues with uh, sort of both the way Craig uh, presents uh, 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 some topics, but also with uh, Peter's critique uh, about them and we can discuss the details later, but I wanna make three broad remarks where I think uh, 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 Peter is, uh, is, is fundamentally mistaken in his critique. Um, but I want to preface this by saying that I don't use Greg's textbook, okay? So it's true that I'm uh, teaching intermediate macroeconomics uh, right now and have been for six years at Notre Dame. I'm not teaching the principles. I, there was no reason for me to use the principles, but I've taught principles before. I'm not using that. And I'm also not using the intermediate macro textbook with the exception of that, uh, the, the little um, pr uh, sort of proto DSGE model that, uh, that, uh, that Greg mentioned, which I thought is very good and, and the exposition is very good. So I'm, I'm using that. In fact, I use no textbook whatsoever uh, 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 for my lecture. Uh, and that will, you, will, uh, you will see uh, uh, how this will be reflected also in my, in my remarks and my own teaching philosophy. So by reveal preference, you can already see that I don't find uh, Greg's textbook sufficiently good to be to be used in my classroom at least, um, um, because I, I think things can be done better. Obviously, uh, uh, the market notwithstanding, obviously uh, uh, Greg mentioned his market success, and um, you know the market uh, uh, has 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 a strong voice, but it's not good enough for me. All right, so now I want to make three points um, uh, where I think Peter is indeed uh, uh, mistaken. So the first one, I think is that he seems to be thinking that textbooks somehow, and, and perhaps even Greg seems to be thinking that textbooks must be like a complete sort of uh, knowledge or presentation of economic knowledge without any loose ends, okay? And I just don't think this is, can ever be the case. Um, uh, we just have to live with that, okay? So there are going to be some, some quirks and indeed some loose ends, and at, especially at the undergraduate uh, level. Um, and, and that's why, by the way, um, uh, so, I, so in other words, I don't think 
even though I recognize the reality that Econ 101 is the only thing that a lot of our students will ever hear of economics, but I also just don't think that Econ 101 should be the end all of uh, economic thinking, of economic uh, policy thinking, right? So for example, I very strongly believe that, you know, um, the value of a rigorous econ PhD even, even for economic policy questions, not just for economic theory, okay? And even those lessons, even the stuff we teach and learn in, you know, second year specialized field classes, they have loose ends, okay? They will have always loose ends and we just have to, just have to live with that. And um, in that sense on Twitter, there was said, so there was this question, is, is Mencu's uh, textbook out of, uh, out of touch with reality in, uh, or something? And I would argue to, I would actually somewhat provocatively say, I hope so. I sure hope it's somewhat out of touch with reality, right? Because in some sense, that is the nature um, of economic modeling. And I'll say a little bit more about that uh, uh, um, in my third point. The second po po point I would like to make related to the first point is, Peter uh, seems to have this notion that textbooks somehow should stand on their own and should not be thought of uh, without a lecture, okay? I'm a strong believer in, uh, you know, the role of the actually of, first of all, of lectures as format, as, uh, traditional lectures as, uh, uh, as, a, as a teaching format and, uh, um, uh, and sort of the textbook being sort of supplementary to that, but the core, the core uh, agent of economic teaching is actually the, 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 the thinking economist, the live thinking economist in the lecture hall. I'm a, I'm a strong believer in that. And I hope I deliver that in my own lectures. That's at least what I'm strive, striving for. And that's why I don't have a textbook really, because I think it's much more important to see that experience, that experienced economist sort of uh, thinking uh, in, a, in, a life, in a life kind of way, which by the way, I, that's why I hate these Zoom formats uh, because you, you lose a lot when you don't uh, uh, experience that in the actual lecture hall. Um, and, and so, and, and I think this is especially important in introductory classes. That's why I'm a big fan of, of actually experienced senior. And I think Greg, uh, uh, the Harvard former, uh, Greg, Greg used to do it. I, I understand now it's Raj Shetty. I sort of, I'm really a fan of research active or at least having been research active senior economists teaching the introductory classes. So that they really have an understanding of what, you know, sort of what the most important points are, but also where the loose ends are, you know, and where sort of the, the corpses are buried, if you wish, in our introductory teaching, right? And so I think this is important. It's, it's important that not only do we want to see economists, but research active economists to have themselves contribute to some of the body of that knowledge that we are teaching. And so, so I'm a strong believer, if you wish, in the old fashioned Humboldtian unity of, 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 of research and, and teaching. And, and, and so just having to, to, to finalize that second point, just relying on a textbook um, uh, that's just not uh, consistent for me with a, with a, with a university education that, is, that deserves its name. The, the, the more important ingredient is the, is the lecturer, not the textbook, okay? That doesn't mean that textbooks are unimportant, but at the end of the day, I think the lecturer that then can put you know, certain elements of a textbook in perspective and interprets uh, in, interpret them uh, is, has the much bigger role. The third point I want to make is, I think Peter commits the mistake that many heterodox uh, uh, people are committing. And, and I, I, in German, this is, this is a word that's easy to say in German, which I call with a philosophical term, hypostasierung, hypostasization. I can't even say it in English. So what do I mean by that? This is this idea that somehow models have to have a one-to, that models are these one-to-one -one, uh, pictures um, uh, uh, of, of reality. So when you, when he, for example, talks about how banks, the nitty gritty details of banking works, okay? But that's not how economic models uh, work. And uh, for someone who really wants to read about it, I recommend that little, that beautiful uh, little tome of, of Danny Rodwick when he talks about uh, the, the, the role and sense of economic model, okay? They are artificial uh, structural entities, if you wish, okay? That in a very indirect and not direct means hopefully help us better understand the world. That's what I, by highlighting certain features, but making certain features of the real world important, okay? And, um, and, 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 and some more sophisticated models to help us also to quantify certain mechanisms, okay? In a very similar way, okay, as, and you may now uh, um, 
clutch your pearls maybe in a very similar way as a good novel makes helps us make sense, sense of the world it's a very different animal economic models are very different animals but the way they they allow me to think about the world is much akin to as i said a good novel or a good uh, a good uh, piece of of theater okay and i think good economists know about that and they will therefore teach the scope conditions the application conditions of these models and will tell you what they're good for and what they're not good for they're always going to lose out uh, leave out certain things as i said there will always be corpses buried there will always be loose ends and it's the good teacher and now i uh, conclude and sort of tie it in with my second remark it's the good teacher the good research economist uh, in the classroom that hopefully will be able to sort of let let these models speak beyond you know so that they're simple math beyond the simple graphs but how they actually relate to uh, a reality so with that i conclude my more general remarks i do have uh, sort of individual points um uh, about the, the the principles and their critique which i can elaborate on later uh, thanks, Rudiger. Uh, we may come to some examples, I think, because it's uh, maybe important to, to check uh, the arguments and, and go uh, if it's just about mainstream or not mainstream or whatever. But maybe Anna will ask, uh, answer part of this question. Uh, Anna Reich from uh, the Network of Pluralist econo Economists or Students uh, in, in Germany. Um, so please, Anna, your remarks on the discussion. Thank you very much. First of all, it's uh, interesting to see myself in this position because I'm confronted with a lot of actual and symbolic power here. I mean, it's very interesting to just speak with all of you on this issue. And the question from the beginning was, um, are textbooks and especially your textbook, Craig Mankiw, out of touch with reality? And I would say, yes, definitely they are. It's not too long ago that I was a student myself and um, yeah, the, there's a lack of usefulness of the standard economic theory to solve the current crisis. And I think we are currently also seeing that in the Corona situation. And preparing for my statement here, I was asking myself, what is new economic thinking that's actually useful? And for me, that would be a problem-based and a solution-oriented economic thinking. And um, I have also, I'm very lucky to teach myself um, economics courses. And I would strongly disagree with what you said, Gregory Mankiw that um, I am visible there as a full person. And I also um, don't know that much. I mean, we all don't know that much. We have theories and we have assumptions on the world, but uh, suffice to say, they don't tell us that much about reality. And um, so I start with my students to ask them, where do they want to go from here? And what is their personal um, utopia? Where do they want to go also in society? And what is their idea of a transformative and sustainable society? And um, then we start from there and ask ourselves, what are transformative practices that are out there in the world? For example, on sustainable finance, agriculture, we talk about housing, we talk about new organizational um, structures, and also the question of um, conflict management, for example, the transaction costs of human interaction are also very important to consider. And I, as a teacher, I'm asking myself, also with the student together, what are the transformative logics behind that? Meaning that are those logics scalable for the great transformation that we are facing right now? And um, it's actually a very big challenge, I think, to put economic thinking into this transformative mindset because that's what we need. And um, that's why I'm also building a new university and also um, a new economic faculty in that. We're building a interna new international or international future in university. And also, I started my own institute on real utopias because it's really important to develop those new kind of narratives. And also, I'm really um, keen on having economists developing them because it's, the time is over that we only have to describe or think of describing reality. And for this discussion, for me, it's super important that we have this kind of um, reversal of um, evidence because the whole um, pluralist economist debate and so on is always framed in the setting of who's right, who's wrong, and it's a lot of uh, conflict. And I would rather ask um, whose theories and whose um, assumptions really help us build a better world and really help us um, build the transformation that we need. And um, in my opinion, um, it's important to co-create co this new uh, reality. And um, the current economic thinking for me is not useful to do that. And um, I'm asking all of you who is in to develop a new economic thinking. And yeah, that would be my remarks because I think the old story 
has shown itself to be over. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna. Um, I would suggest that uh, Peter will um, react to um, Greg and a little bit to, to Rüdiger first, and um, maybe we can touch some ex concrete examples in, in the discussion because it will maybe help to, to make to be more concrete and uh, see who's probably right or wrong. Peter, it's not about uh, right or wrong, but. So I'm a little bit surprised that uh, Greg and also Rudy tried to push me into the heterodox corner, saying that firstly, if people are not satisfied with the way uh, economics is presented, um, he must be heterodox. I don't feel myself heterodox, I must say. And I want to ask Rudy and Greg, if I present the role of banks in a way as the Bank of England presents it, and if I think this is the way it should be also presented in a modern macroeconomic textbook, is this heterodox? Or if I talk about the minimum wage and say, okay, you can present it with perfect competition, or you can present it with a monopsony on the demand side of labor. And if I look at the evidence on minimum wages, which is very, very wide, and, and, and there's a lot of evidence that minimum wages do not uh, uh, race unemployment, is this heterodox? If I talk about the relation between income distribution and growth and say there's not this one way thing that whenever uh, income incomes are distributed more equally, we have less growth, is this heterodox? So I'm a little bit surprised because this is easy way out. Say, okay, he must be heterodox. <laughs> and therefore we don't have to take it so serious. And I think it's also what, what uh, Rudy said. And no, 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 no. I no. never. I don't think I used the word heterodox at all. That was you used it. You used it. I've taken it here. You used the word heterodox. Sorry, I. I, I okay. I, I, don't, I, I don't view as you as heterodox. Okay, then. then that's I, not my point. Okay, okay. Then, I, then honestly, then, not my. Okay, point. Then, then I'm happy. But but again, but one, to to your point that you say, well, um, the model model must not be a one to one picture of reality. I completely agree. But I would say a model should at least present the mechanics that are predominant in reality. If you talk about banks, I would say it's obvious that banks can create deposits out of nothing. And if you don't, but of course you can also present the other model, the loanable funds model. I would agree with you. I, I present both models. You can say, well, there's a loanable funds model and there is the model that as, as the Bank of England create, uh, presents it. But I think both models should be there and if, if the student today wants to know about the financial system, if you only tell him about the loanable funds model, what does he know? That, that depends on the lecture. I mean, we have been talking about this, going back and forth, post Keynesians in Germany about this, about this uh, uh, triviality for me. It's a triviality that, of course, a, an individual bank can create deposits out of thin air. The question is what this means, and in reality, the uh, 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 in reality, people play tennis and they have lots of sex and they have all kinds of other things, and we don't usually have them in most economic models, except of models of I don't know family economics or something like that. Well, but so that the question is, what does it matter for? Okay, and I think people completely overestimate uh, the importance of that. This of that. Uh, of that fact about banks' account uh, account statements, they 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 think somehow this uh, this uh, um, yeah this matters for macroeconomics. By the way, I for example, let me agree with you. I completely agree that the, the money multiplier theory is basically, can I say it, bullshit? I mean, I think I I just do not totally teach agree. it. I do I, I do not teach it. But the way I mean, there's only so many things you can do in a macroeconomic lecture. I I and maybe this is a mistake. Maybe we should think. Maybe we should put more banks in the the, the microstructure of banks. But to the extent that I don't do it, you know, uh, I start off with a. I basically sidestep the banking sector uh, anyway in macroeconomic lectures and just uh, tell and start with a simplified assumption and telling the students right away that this is not necessarily a true assumption, but gets you a long way that the central bank just controls the money supply or outright, right? There is no banking sector whatsoever. So I completely sidestep the money multiplier because I think it's a destruction. And then of course I move on to more modern monetary theories where 
where uh, monetary policy theories, where we think of monetary policy of setting interest rates and in some sense but, governing. But we should not, we should not uh, go governing, to much No, 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 but governing portfolio decisions. That's just the point is no, no, that, that, uh, that uh, just to give you a concrete example where I partially agree with your critique about some, some of what, and maybe Greg doesn't like the money multiplier, he can say it, and, and he feels an obligation to present it because that's how traditionally economists have thought about it. I, I think it's, 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 it should be gone. I don't like the money, money multiplier. That's my personal idiosyncrasy. And in, some, in that sense, I do disagree a little bit with Greg as well to say we should only represent uh, uh, the mainstream of economics. I partly agree with him, but partly, as I said, and I, I, I hope I made this clear, you know, you should get an added value of, uh, of listening to Rüdiger Bachmann in Indiana University at Notre Dame. Because otherwise, why not just watch YouTube videos of Greg Mankiw? If that's all there is, then just watch the YouTube videos of Greg Mankiw. And Mankiw, Greg would probably like that. But I think I can add, uh, I can, you know, add an additional value in the classroom to my students where I present them mostly the mainstream and sort of what other economists are, but add here and there personal touches of what I think maybe even the mainstream uh, has gotten wrong. Can, can, I think there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, one, one, one remarks on, on what you said uh, with the lecturer. I completely agree that the role of the lecturer really matters. That's why I came to write my own book because I didn't like the textbooks that were there. And so I made my own course, developed my own courses. And of course, then it became a textbook. But I think you're really right. I think the lecture is really relevant and, and matters. And, and so I completely agree with this. One point to what Greg said, yes, in a sense, I take him as a representative of a kind of core view on, on economics. That's, that's completely correct. Uh, yourself, uh, regard yourself as an ambassador of, of economics. And it's a certain way of, of traditional economics that, that you present and you are completely right. There are many other textbooks which I could criticize in the same way. And so I, I take you as a kind of representative, but I think that's fair because it's, as you said, it's the most uh, most popular textbook, but, but definitely similar critiques could be made to other textbooks. I think so that's, that's, that's very, very clear. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, so, um, I, I would like to, to ask a question to, to Greg. Would you say that, I mean, you, you describe principles in, in your book. Have these principles evolved or is there anything that is moving? I mean, remembering the, or, or what has been written about economics in the 1960s or 70s, this has been different. The mainstream has been different as I understood. Uh, so since uh, you have published your book and, and since what has been established mainstream, are there things that have evolved or where you would say, well, maybe one or the other principle isn't true anymore or not as in the way it was? The, the books certainly evolve over time. E, 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 both of my books are on three-year cycles. So I, my publisher basically expects a new version every three years. And I go through the book and completely with an editor and also the input of many instructors. They survey instructors, some of which are using the book, some of which aren't, saying, what do you like and dislike about the book? How can it be improved? Um, and so on. And so topics sort of you know, come and go. So for example, you know, recent editions have a little box on Bitcoin, which didn't exist, of course, when the books first came out. So the, for sure, um, the, 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 the books evolve. The big principles, I mean, are, are pretty timeless, I think. Things like principle number one and in, in the introductory work is people face trade-offs and talks about the different kinds of trade-offs that people face in different contexts. Um, that's where the trade-off between equality and efficiency comes in, the, the, what Peter critiqued and I responded to earlier. Um, the idea that people face trade-offs in their life and in and both as individuals and in society, I think that's pretty, pretty timeless. I, I can't imagine any economists disagreeing with that as a, as a general principle, maybe the specific applications they might quibble with. Uh, uh, but, I'm, but, it's, but it is always evolving and I'm always changing. Like I mentioned earlier that I used to spend much more time on real business cycle theory, which I didn't particularly agree with, but I thought I needed to because it was prominent. And as that's faded from the mainstream, as an important, as in a very few, I think there's relatively few adherence these days to it, I've reduced the, the coverage of that substantially in my intermediate book. So absolutely, they, they evolve with the times. And similarly, the, somebody mentioned, we talked about the money multiplier a minute ago. I have wondered about how to deal with that. And I think the students understand that in the current monetary arrangements, it's not very important. 
I'm reluctant to say it's not important at all because economics is not just about today's institutional arrangements, it's about historical institutional arrangements. So if you look at it, yes, you know, what, if you talk about the Great Depression, why did the money supply collapse in the 1930s? You would have to kind of understand the money multiplier because the monetary base didn't collapse, but the only multiplier did because people took their money out of banks and banks sold, holding more excess reserves. And unless you understand the money multiplier, I don't think you can make full sense of the Great Depression. So I think the, the, the things we teach have to be not only a function of what's going on today in the world, but also in economics throughout history. So there's a certain timelessness to, to economics. It, it's actually very edifying. Let me this as an exercise for some readers. Go back and pick up a very, very old economics textbook and read it and say, okay, how, what does this do we agree with now? What, what, what do we disagree with? I actually picked up a couple of um, years ago, the first economics textbook written by a Harvard professor. The guy was named Francis Bowen and he wrote his, this textbook at around, I think it was around 1850s, I think it was. Uh, he, there wasn't even an economics department at Harvard at the time. He was a, in the philosophy department, but he wrote the first, he taught the first economic, one of the first economics courses at Harvard. And he um, uh, wrote the first textbook by a Harvard professor that I know of. And I read that and it was kind of interesting to know, see what he dis emphasized, what he didn't emphasize, how he taught it, and wh what ideas are timeless and which ones are, are very time contingent. Uh, I actually wrote an essay called The Past in future of Econ 101, if people want to read about my, my basically my review of, of Francis Bowen. But anyway, so pick pick up you know an old Samuelson or even older than that, you know, a Marshall, and read that because I think it gives you a sense of what we're doing today. And there's a certain timelessness to what we're doing today. A lot of the ideas that we teach today were still there even 150 years ago. And I think it, it, it's useful to keep touch with our um, our past because we sort of get, get, get a better perspective on on the present. Uh, and, and one con very concrete one, because uh, um, the new American president will start and will, among the first things that he will do, raise the minimum wage. It seems as if, uh, to my uh, perception, uh, there's not a very large uh, sense of saying among economists that this is completely wrong. Um, and maybe this has changed also, or is it a, a wrong? Oh, I, you know, I, say, I say that in the books. If you read the section of the minimum wage, it presents the standard analysis in competitive markets. And then it says that economists disagree about, about the effects of the minimum wage, not agreement. And in fact, one of the ways I try to become an ambassador in the, my introductory book is I, in the past two editions, I've had these little sidebars, based, basically the polls of economists based on the IGM panel, the University of Chicago runs with a poll economists on a variety of issues. And whenever it's sort of the relevant issue comes up, there's a, there's a little box saying, you know, here's how economists think about this. And then there's one in the minimum wage section that says, you know, to, you know, what do we think about raising the minimum wage? And I don't remember exactly the questions worded, but you can actually see that economists are very divided about the minimum wage. I don't, I don't present it as like all economists agree. I said, no, this is what happens in this model. What do economists think? And I, and I Admit that 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 that's a case where economists are are really very much in disagreement. Whereas in things like rent control, I think is another example of a of a price control where I think economists tend to be more in agreement that they, 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 there was more consensus against rent controls than there is against um, uh, minimum wages. And what I don't do actually, which I think Peter I think Peter raised a good point, I don't present the minimum wage with monopsony. There's actually in, in the, I think in the discussion of of, of hacker markets. There is a discussion of monopsony, oh, very brief, admittedly, discussion of monopsony um, in, in labor markets. But what I do not talk about is um, you know, minimum wage under monopsony. That'd be an interesting question. Should I add that? And one of the big, as a textbook writer, one of the big questions is what to include, what not to include. And so you're, really, you're, you're prioritizing. Um, I mean, one way, sort of the way I use it, I, I, I don't present the monopsony model either because. It's not clear that students, at least in the American context, will have had that, will sort of had the micro part of it. Uh, but what you, the way I present it is basically, usually in a problem set, I basically say, now let's assume that the income effect dominates, right? And, no. then, you, and then you get a downward sloping labor supply curve, and depending on the relative slope of the uh, downward labor supply curve and labor demand curve, you get downward wage spirals, okay? And you get Im immiserization spirals. And I think students can understand that even if they don't quite understand the nitty gritty details about uh, substitution and income effects, but this notion that you might want to work more if you lower, if you lower the wage to sort of keep your income up, I think that's, you know, that's a natural, uh, a very natural idea. And so, and at that point, you know, when that market disequilibrium becomes uh, sort of 
unstable, um, uh, even in a perf perfectly competitive market, uh, the minimum wage has, has a role to play because otherwise it, it, it helps a market uh, it prevent market disequilibration in some sense, right? So that's the way to introduce a minimum wage. Uh, I think that's uh, very interesting. I, 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 uh, the I talk benevolent about... effects of a minimum wage, even in a perfectly competitive market. You know, I do talk about income and substitution effects on labor supply in my, my micro book. I don't, think, I don't bring the minimum wage in that context. So that's an interesting question whether to bring that in. If one thing about my books, by the way, is that they are short compared to the, my, many of my competitors. I, I try to, is I, 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 I have a feeling that we tend to overstuff our courses with too much. And so I try to pare them down in order to make them more manageable. It's not a short, but principles book is 800 pages. It's not a short book, but you know, many books are over a thousand pages. So, it's short by comparison, it's not a short book. The question is what to exclude. And, and it's, it's always a balancing act, deciding you know, what models to include, what models not to include. How some of these just allude to effects without actually bringing them up. And that's always a tricky thing in, in, in both in teaching and in, and in textbook writing. I agree with this, but isn't it somehow biased a little bit, the balancing act in your book? Well, I, I don't, I, well that's an interesting question. I'll, go through, I'll, I, I'll, I'll keep that in mind as I revise. I don't agree with your Ronald Reagan quote that you came, started with, by the way. That government's always a problem. I'm very much into government. Some, there's some things markets can do well, and some things that, that markets fail at, and then we need government to come in. Um, and I, and I, the way, especially when I teach the micro part of the book, but but, but Greg, that's the big. I, me, that's the big the theme. Question? Can I ask a question? So though, so I, I disagree with Peter's critique on the the the, in, the equality and growth inequality and growth rate of. But the way you introduce it is all through distribution. And then you kind of say, ah, this depends on your personal philosophy uh, or your social philosophy. But well, why don't you right away speak of inefficiencies as well? I mean, there's, well, there's a variety of, of reasons for government intervention. Peter mentioned them, efficiency reasons, right? The market might just be inefficient. For I agree. Them. Um, many reasons. I mean, obviously, we agree, we all agree on that. It's not, this is completely you know, you know, I, and, and, you know, for that reason. And, and there's distribution and there's stabilization. So I like the Musgr Musgraves team. So why even start with, oh, the government is only needed for redistribution, which, by the way, I would say, uh, I would also argue, you know, uh, and I don't know. That's no, 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 hold on, hold on. Hold on Rudy, Rudy, Rudy. I do not start off saying the government's only needed okay. for distribution. I actually start off by talking about inefficiency. I think externalities is the first example right. of government exactly. that I use. I mean, to me, I, I actually brought in externalities much earlier in this course okay. than, than most of the standard micro books, because to my mind, right. externalities are probably the most pervasive form of market failure. Exactly. And, 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 and uh, as, you, as you may know, I'm a big advocate of carbon taxes. Yes, exactly. So, yes. so, I, so I talk about that quite early. And, and it's, it's actually, so I believe, I could double check this, I believe we talk about externalities, then we talk about market power, and then we talk about distribution. Yeah. I, mean, I, think th that's, I think those are the order in which the topics are, are, are right. That's all, but this is, Peter's referring to the first chapter of the book, and all these things occur within three pages of each other. Right. Um, so they're all they're all they're all there. I'm not. It's not. It's not, it's not like government's only there for for redistribution. It's there for inefficiency as well. Absolutely. And the reason I had this phrase, depending on your political philosophy, is I recognize that there's different people out there. There are utilitarians out there, but there's also libertarians out there. So, you know, there's you know Robert Nozick's not going to have the same view as John Stuart Mill about redistribution. So I, I, I know that that's yeah. a normative question. That's a normative question that's going to depend on one's political philosophy. Whenever you're going to make normative statements, you, you got to recognize it's not just economics, it's also a little bit of political philosophy. And indeed, a chapter on, um, uh, on inequality talks about uh, not only libertarians like Nozick, but talks about Rawls and talks about the utilitarians and saying different philosophers come to this question with different normative um, presumptions. That's true, but I think we should also Anna, know please, Rudiger, um, we should let Anna. Uh, yeah, uh, I have a meta point that I would really enjoy a more structured discussion because I don't really think that uh, screaming at each other on a Zoom <laughs> is that uh, much of a useful interaction. And uh, also, new economic thinking would uh, be a more, um, yeah, what is that, a more approachable thing of discussion. Or I would really like to to hear what you're saying. And I want to come back to you, Gregory, to um, what you said. I would strongly disagree. There's no timelessness in economics. So you said there is a timelessness, and I would say that's not the case. And in my opinion, we really need to reinvent so much. And 150 years is nothing. I mean, we have a, such a long history of um, beings, and there's so much going uh, to be in the future, so many more years. And when I hear you speak, I think there's going to be kind of an out competition of the old um, by the new economists that are now taking over. 
And um, I wanted to ask you personally, each of one, each one of you, do you all think that with the current economic thinking that we are well prepared for the future and what's ahead? Because I actually don't think so. And I would really like to, to hear from you if you think that's, that we are well equipped with the economic tools or the tools of economic thinking that we have. My own view is that there are certain timelessness of the tools, but the tools have to be applied to changing circumstances. So for example, climate change, that's obviously a relatively new problem. That wasn't a problem they talk, thought, thought, thought about 150 years ago. On the other hand, most, many economists have looked at this, whether it's Bill Nordhaus or Nicholas Stern, have come to the conclusion that what we need is a tax on carbon. Well, that's an idea that goes, dates back to Arthur Pergou, who, who wrote well before we knew about anything about climate change. So I think that those old ideas, those tools are still very useful, but we should apply them in new and creative ways as the set of circumstances that we face as a society changes. I would agree with that. It's also, it's also to say that economics con continually develops new tools, right? I mean, uh, uh, what are all these new exciting PhD students doing? I mean, they, you know, we had to, we've just recently had the big data or are in the midst of a big data revolution uh, led by Greg's colleagues, uh, Rashetti, but spreading around the world in some sense, right? Uh, the, what, what, what research and the tools we are using. So I agree, the, some of these old ideas are still relevant and they are timeless in the sense that they belong, I would say philosophically to the human condition. To the, it's almost like the, the existing of human conditions in non-paradisical uh, situations, basically, right? That's what is the absence of the paradise is basically that we face trade-offs at, at the end of the day. Economics was born the moment Adam and Eve were driven out of paradise, basically, at that, that, that point. And I think that's a that's sort of a human that's just a human constancy that that will stay with us. But of course, we develop the applications of these models, and we continue to, as I said, to uh, um, to develop the tools. Uh, um, and am I satisfied with economics? Of course, I'm not satisfied with economics. Uh, Greg's student, uh, famous student, uh, uh, um, uh, Ricardo Reich, put it in a very nice essay uh, uh, not so long ago. If he said he said basically. If I was satisfied with economics, I, I wouldn't have a job. I wouldn't go to the office anymore. And this is exactly, that's exactly, he's exactly right. If we are not satisfied with economics, otherwise, uh, at least the ones that, you know, working on the research, um, we, we, we wouldn't have a job or we would do something else. We wouldn't do research anymore. No, I think Anna, 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 uh, 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 Greg and I have a very different philosophy. I don't necessarily, I don't see it as the view of, uh, I don't see it as a job of economists or economics and economists to change the world. I really don't. Uh, I'm an old fashioned, I believe in democracy. I think it's up to the sovereign to change the world um, and not economists, not platonic uh, kings. Uh, I don't view that economists should be platonic kings. And uh, our job is to understand the world and give uh, people that want to change society democratically uh, the tools to do so. But I really don't think, and I would suspect that uh, at least Greg agrees with me. I don't know, maybe Peter probably too, actually, um, that it's our job to change the world. I really don't. I think it's our job to educate people so that if they want to change the world, they'll exactly. have the better tools to do yes. it. Yes, that's exactly right. Should we open the discussion now a little bit? I yes. think there's yeah, many, yeah. many questions. And so we are a little bit... Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the big problem that we have about uh, 75 questions already. So what we uh, want to do is to uh, all copy them and uh, send them out also to the discussions. And uh, so they won't be lost. Uh, at least they won't. Uh, and some of you may have the time to, to answer. So I just can take some... Uh, I would like to ask Vinit Rishi. Uh, to ask uh, the question and um, then Sascha Bützer, maybe if you are online and you want to, to unmute, um, I would be interested in hearing your question. Bini. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. And thank you all for the very interesting conversation. Um, I'd like to go back to a question Bini. Anna was asking. Sorry. Bini. Yes. Uh, just to introduce yourself quickly. Yes, sure. Sorry about that. So my name is Vinit Rishi. I work for the Oak Foundation. I'm based in Geneva. Um, my role is secretary to the foundation, director of administration, and I'm responsible for our India program. Um, the question I have kind of goes back to what Anna was saying. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing that a lot of the economic theory has 
that, that I was taught when I went to university doesn't seem to work in the real world. And so we're seeing huge amounts of money being printed, for instance, and we see zero inflation. We're seeing the invisible hand doesn't quite work um, as, as it's described. So there's fundamental questions about the, the theory that students are coming out with and, and, and believing. And so what are your own views about that? I mean, we're talking about mainstream economics, but mainstream economics is perpetuating some beliefs that um, we, we see don't actually work in the real world. So what are your views about that? And how will that change and, and evolve um, for each of you? Let's start. Um, well, I'm probably not so heterodox because I think what we're experiencing right now is a typical case for Keynesian market economics. We have huge demand shock, we have also some supply shocks, but overall it's a huge global demand shock. And the governments are now stabilizing the economy with deficit spending. It's financed by the central bank. So there's some kind of modern monetary theory added. But I think overall it, it fits with the kind of standard uh, Keynesian paradigm. And, and I would say so far it works. We don't have the same collapse in global demand as we have seen in the Great Depression. And so I'm not so much a revolutionary. Uh, I would like to see the focus different in many things, but overall, I think um, standard macroeconomics isn't, isn't that bad if it's applied in the right way. Uh, I, I, I agree with that. I agree with a lot of that. Let me also point out, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you, anybody thinks there's no link between money creation and inflation, I think they should take a little vacation in Zimbabwe. Because yeah, I think I, it, I think it, I think it, I mean, I, th I think there still is a link, and I think there's an interesting question of whether we'll whether if the Fed allows all this money to stay in the system post pandemic, post recession, whether that would be inflationary. I think there's a lot, there's a lot of debate about that right now. Um, thank you, uh, Sasha Butzer. I would uh, like to answer shortly on Vinit, to Vinit. Yes. Um, for me, it will be. Kind of everyone in, uh, in the world knows something is off right now and uh, I think you ask how is the change going to come about and I think that the new theories or a new understanding of what it means to be human in this world and also scientifically thinking about it that's that is going to change and it has to change and it's less fighting for scarce resources but the question of how a good life can be um, led and also how the theories of economic thinking can describe a better life and a better um, living situation for everybody in the world. So I think that's uh, what I said before. It's kind of an out-competing process. Sasha, you're down. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so my name is uh, Sasha Butzer. I'm, uh, I'm a senior advisor to the German executive director at the IMF. And it's great to see uh, the ones that I've, I've met before, especially Thomas, of course, with, with New Paradigm. Very much enjoyed the discussion. Um, so thanks a lot for that. Um, I, I would have two questions essentially and and some of which have already been been touched upon a little bit but my question um, was primarily towards what what um, Greg was saying that you know textbooks should present the view of mainstream economists which I certainly think is 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 correct that students should be exposed to that but at the same time um, they should be exposed to um, I mean well, textbooks should strive to be factually correct right so um, I think one example that came up is the, is the money mul multiplier slash loanable funds, which has been refuted um, by, by, you know, central banks pretty prominently over the past few years and has, you know, very big implications for uh, both macroeconomic theory, um, be it, you know, if you look at savings investment, if you look at credit cycles, and it's fairly easy to, to explain, actually. So I was at, at Deutsche Bundesbank before. The, it's, it's a, they have a textbook for, for um, high school students where they explain how, how money is traded. So it's, it's not a, a difficult theoretical exercise. And uh, that's actually something what heterodox economists since that word came up have been saying for you know, several decades in the, in the post-Keynesian spectrum. Um, so I would be in, interested to hear um, your view on that, Greg. Um, it, it, the second point, um, uh, likewise, pertaining to this mainstream economic exposure, um, uh, and, and you've touched upon on the issue of inequality. And um, while certainly, you know, if you look at Oaken and Merlis, what, 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 who, who you cited, I mean, these, these have been seminal works, but they are also decades old. 
whereas basically all modern empirical evidence, um, if you look at actually, you know, the IMF has a book on it, several research papers, Saya, Zuckman, Piketty, um, you know, point actually to the opposite, that there is indeed no equity efficiency trade-off for moderate levels of redistribution, but rather the opposite. Um, so, so in, in a sense, right now, the mainstream, um, I, would, I would say the mainstream I'm experiencing within, you know, the mainstream institutions is actually that, uh, that it's, it's quite the opposite and shouldn't that also be reflected in, in, in the textbooks as, as such. Thank you. I mean, in terms of loanable funds, I don't know what you mean by it's been refuted. I mean, to me, loanable funds is really just the IS curve. It's investment and saving. Um, and it's saying that, uh, and it's not really about banking in particular, it's about the financial system. Of, the financial system redirects resources from people who want to save to people who want to borrow to invest. And that borrowing can take, can take the form of debt finance or can take the form of equity finance. And it's really, it's about, it's, it's, it's a this simple story of what, what the role of financial markets is uh, in the macro economy. So I don't buy this story that's been refuted. I mean, I, I don't think it's, I think it's sort of more fundamental than you're making it out. Um, in terms of inequality, I, mean, I, I think if, I think most economists believe that if you try to redistribute resources more and more and more, at some point you're gonna uh, re reduce, reduce the, the trade-off. The, the cross-national comparisons really struck me as not all that edifying in the sense that there's lots, I mean, if the only difference across countries was that they, they were all exactly the same, except some have more redistributive systems than not others, then yeah, you could use that as a test of whether there's a trade-off between equality and efficiency. But there's lots and lots of differences between countries beyond the amount of inequality they have. So I, I think that cross-national comparisons are very, very hard to interpret. It reminds me of an old story about Milton Friedman, where some Swedish economists said to Milton Friedman, you know, Professor Friedman, we have uh, very little poverty in Scandinavia, to which Friedman replied, well, that's interesting because in the United States, we also have very little poverty among Scandinavians. Um, so the point is that there's, there's lots of differences across the countries that, that simply sort of comparing two countries say, aha, see, there's no, there's no trade off between equality and efficiency. I think that's way too good. Someone else to answer, Rudiger? No, I agree. I think uh, uh, this would have been but my one point I, I i agree again with peter on the one hand that you know it's not that simple uh, that it, that is always just a trade off or something like that um but uh, the evidence that he presents with simple cross country uh, they just don't tell you much i mean for the exact reasons that that greg mentioned and so um so i i just so the the counter argument just wasn't very good um you can't just look at uh, at cross country comparisons uh, the way you would think about this, you would have to think about this in terms of counterfactuals for which you would, in the absence of obvious, we can't run economic experiments with entire countries. The only, only way we, we, can, we can do anything is we can, we can ask our models to run counterfactuals. And, um, and uh, uh, yeah, so it's just not that easy. Again, <laughs> as, to, as to the loanable fund thing, I also agree with uh, Greg Mankiw. This is the financial system. It's not just about banking. Maybe this is also a little bit sort of a European US misunderstanding in the sense that that um, that, that there's just a much more a bigger role for capital markets in the United States than in Europe. So that, that so in Europe, every, especially in Germany, everyone thinks the only way you get money is from banks. That's just not true in the United States. There's a, the, the capital markets have a much broader role. Uh, to celebrate uh, to, 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 uh, of what they're doing. And indeed, uh, uh, to, the, to a large extent, these capital markets, including banks, banks do something else than just take in deposits, okay? In fact, that's a minor activity of what they're doing. Uh, uh, they do function in these activities, at least as financial intermediaries. So I, I, I just don't think that, 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 the, that, that there is a refutation. That's what I meant before. I mean, you, uh, post Keynesians pick out this minor detail that, yeah, yes, it's true that banks can, if they want, create uh, loans and deposits out of thin air. And, but of course, they face constraints of that. So it's not really thin air, right? That's the point. Because at some point, if this was a unified bank, yes, that is true. But of course, there are different banks. And if you want to take out that deposit, at some point, you have to settle it with central bank currency. And all of these things, you know, are 
complicated. There's network aspects of the banking system. So if you really want to model that, that's good. We should as, you know, at the research frontier, but I don't think this belongs in an introductory textbook and, uh, or in even an intermediate textbook. So, so I think this, 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 this insight, the so-called insight uh, is, it's just for reality, um, the way I think about the macroeconomy is just completely blown out of proportion. No, I would completely yeah. disagree with this. Funds, financial funds, are not created by savers, neither in the United States nor in Germany. Financial funds, in the sense of, in the sense of money, is always created by banks. Savers cannot create any funds in reality. And the same, in the same way, if, if Greg says the IS curve is a representation of loanable funds, it's completely wrong. The IS curve is the goods market in the Keynesian model, and the financial system is represented in the Keynesian model with the LM curve. So the financial sector in the SLM model is the LM curve, and it has nothing to do with investment and saving. Um, and then well, the way, I, the way I present loanable funds is investment savings. I have a graph of investment and savings as a function of the interest rate. And, the, and, and you, can you, can you can derive the IS curve from Y equals C plus I plus G, or you can write that as Y minus C minus G, which is savings equals I. And that's, that's true. Those are, just, those are just two different ways of representing the same but thing. Not, I, but I, yes. I, I talk about loanable funds, I'm talking about S and I. And there, or, or you could say it's the goods, goods market. That's just, that, those are just equivalent by a simple arithmetic. No, no. I and S, you can use INS for the IS curve, but if you say investment and saving represent the financial system, what the loanable funds theory says, they don't do that. The financial system in the in the Keynesian model is the LM curve. Yeah, that's the financial system of, well, of I, the Keynesian model. You I, cannot have, I, you cannot have maybe you don't like my use of the word loanable funds, but when I use the word loanable funds, I'm referring to S, which is the savers, who could and then and then through a variety of intermediaries. They direct that to I, and that's what I call loanable funds. Maybe you don't like that. We use the word loanable funds. No, I like loanable funds, but it's a misinterpretation. You can, but you can discuss this in more detail. Maybe if I could just clarify mm -hmm. my question. Uh, for example, basically what I meant with with S equals with savings and investment, and obviously S equals I, is that basically from an endogenous money perspective, uh, and and what what Peter just said, basically, and also what Rudiger just said, you know, banks create money. Uh, when, when they give a loan. So basically the, the um, uh, causality runs from investment towards savings and not the, the other way around. So basically you don't need to forego consumption in order to undertake investment. Now, obviously you have an inflation constraint, uh, you know, you have a real resource constraint, banks have equity constraints and, and extending loans, profitability constraints, but they don't have a savings or deposit constraint, which is posited by the loanable funds model. And I think, um, you know, if, if, if you want to look at it in the model environment, you know, Kumhoff at the Bank of England, he has some, some great papers on this and also tries to, you know, embed it in a, a DSGE model. So I think that's really something that's fundamentally relevant for, for macroeconomic thinking and could, should be better reflected even in, in introductory textbooks. Okay, uh, before I hand over to uh, Janina Urban for another question, I, I would just like to make a, a point or just a question on what you said, Greg, on the, I mean, the difference between Scandinavians or Americans and that you both can, can't learn very much from each other. I mean, doesn't that contradict your, the principles? I mean, the, and that's what, what we were taught in, in Europe. Oh, oh no, 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 no. I'm not saying we can't learn from each other. We absolutely can. And I think international comparisons are useful. In fact, my most cited paper was exactly an international comparison. I think they're very hard. There's lots of differences across countries. So I don't think you can simply look at plot, say growth and inequality or, or, or per capita income and inequality and say, aha, this shows something about redistribution policy. Because there's so many differences across countries and you have to be, they have to correct for so many different things. It becomes very, very difficult. Yeah, so uh, Janina, Janina, hold on. Yeah, I actually posed uh, two questions. Um, <laughs> so, but I will pick the, the second one, um, just with a slight hint. On the first one, uh, in, a, in a study that um, also Thomas Fricke did in a survey with economists, he actually showed how um, not stable the like uh, well-conceived views of economists are regarding uh, fiscal policies and very much um, also dependent on um, the political context. So, but that's just a, a comment. Um, my question was, 
um, well, kind of was discussed, but uh, this this argument that okay, it very much depends on the lecturer to teach something better, so something that's more up to date. Um, that directs the the question away from this discussion that we are having um, right here. So, what is like kind of the core of economics, which students, um, uh, which you kind of seem to agree uh, should learn, is? Uh, so, I'm kind of asking, um, yeah, is this discussion taking place somewhere? And um, yeah, how can we all take part in that? I mean, I think that what we teach will evolve over time as what economists think evolves over time. I, I don't actually think of textbooks as being the, the mechanism by which the mainstream changes. And so like if I write a different, if I re revise my textbook, all of a sudden the, the mainstream is gonna think differently. It's more like the mainstream is gonna evolve as they go to conferences, as they debate policies, as they write op-eds, and then that's gonna be reflected in the textbooks. So I, th I, I, I think there may be a mistake but I'd love to think that I can I can direct the mainstream of the economics question since we were revising my book, but I don't think I have that that power. I think I'm I'm I am what I try to do is provide a very clear and accessible reflection of the mainstream. I, I think the main the mainstream will evolve through a lot of different forms, including this. I mean, this is I think this is a very useful kind of event um, as people fine tune their views of the world. Okay, um, I would ask Thomas Kopp. Uh, if you're still online to ask his question. And we always need to bring people in. Yes, please. We can't hear you. Hello? Ah, now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah. Oh, my. Uh, first, yeah, thank you very much for putting together this interesting discussion. And also thank you for, yeah, for all participants for uh, contributing to this lively discussion. My question was actually to Fred Mankiw. So you argued repeatedly that um, what you're saying is merely representing what is economic mainstream. However, you also made clear that you're the best-selling author of the of the author of the most sold economics textbook. So, wouldn't you agree that what you write is also perpetuating and actually partly defining what is contemporary um, mainstream in economic thinking? Um, and then it's um, yeah, you're not only representing, you're also defining, and that is like um, <laughs> pretty different. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing what you think about that. Yeah, to some degree, that's true, but I, this gets back to my previous answer. I, I, I think you overestimate my, my influence. If I started, if I, if I got in my head one morning, uh, gee, I really think the economic mainstream should go in some other direction, and I completely revise my books inconsistent with what most economists thought, they would just drop my book and start using some other book that's more consistent with what they thought. So I don't think I influence what most economists think. I think what my job as a textbook author is to, set, to, to, to say, look, this is what most people want to teach. Um, can I explain that clearly and in a way that students can easily access? And so I, I, I view myself as not defining the mainstream. I really don't think that's what I'm trying to do. My view is I'm trying to exposit the mainstream. And I, I, I really think it'd be a mistake to overestimate um, uh, my influence on the economics profession. I would strongly disagree with that. When I was a first year bachelor student, um, we were presented with your idea as like, that's the real world and that's the truth. So I'm not sure if it's the, the, the um, issue with the lecturers themselves, but- well, no, I, think, I, I think it's a good, I admit, I'm, sure, I'm sure what you're saying is right. So I guess it, they, said they, they, they said that because I was expressing what they thought. I'm uh, not actually sure if that's true. I mean, um, we are presented as first year students or we were presented like, this is the case, this is the truth, that's economic thinking, that's how it's done. And that's sharply different from any um, first uh, like lecture series in politics and or in political science or in any other um, 
um, faculties. So the question here is, what is different about what you write and what people teach? I think there's more commonality. Say- I think there's more commonality about what we, we believe to be true among economists and our other social scientists. I think if you if you go, if you go into a introductory physics class, they're going to teach you a bunch of tools like Newtonian mechanics. Yeah, but and we they, don't they, have them in economics. Oh, hold on, hold on. They're going to say, you know, this, this is how balls drop. Yeah. No, right. actually, that's not true, right? Einstein showed that Newton was wrong, but it's a pretty good model for some purposes. Similarly, we have certain models that we believe, you know, supply and demand model. I mean, my book is big into emphasizing supply and demand. It's not perfect, like, as, as Peter talked about, there's, you know, there's monopsony and so on, perhaps. But I spend a lot of time emphasizing supply and demand. And I think a lot of economists think it's a pretty useful model for lots of purposes. Um, it's, whether you believe in market success, like market efficiency, or you believe in externalities, you can express that through demand curves. So whether you believe that markets fail or, or, or succeed, supply and demand is a useful apparatus for explaining these set of ideas. I think there's more commonality in the set of tools that we all economists agree on than there is in say political science or sociology. So I think that's why you're gonna, you're gonna find more similarity across introductory economics courses than you will find in similarity across introductory sociology courses. But even though in physics you have contradictory theories, and so in economics you're not presented with contradictory theories, and we are not physics, are we? So I think we are the only subject that really has this clear and and, and close worldview that we are presented with as students. And um, I I strongly would uh, invite you to to really um, take in the huge influence you have with your textbooks and that you're really creating reality for students, for many students. And it depends on the lecturers themselves if they make clear that it's just assumptions or models. Because the, the, the thing with economic teaching is that we are presented with the truth. And also the, the, the science of economics is also taken more serious, seriously than other sciences. And also by advising politicians, people really give us a huge credibility. They say, ah, you're the economist, you must know. So we have to be really, really careful what we say. And by yeah, really, like, that's I, reality, we shape reality. <laughs> that's really- I agree. I, no, I agree. You know, in, in every, every three years, the, my publisher sends out my book to 30 or 40 professors who give me f- detailed feedback. And if, mm-hmm. if, if they think I'm, bi- I'm biasing something one way or over, over explaining stuff or not giving enough caveats or whatever, um, they give me feedback. And I work with my editor to try to respond to that. So. I'm, I'm, I, one of the reasons I know I'm kind of trying to represent the mainstream is, you know, they send out to 40 people, I'm getting this consensus. And all I hear feedback, if three people say this, this, you know, this was a bit, this sentence was biased, I'll say, damn, I mean, it's probably biased if three people came to that conclusion. So I, re- I, I really do take my job seriously and try to re- respond to feedback. That's why I actually very much appreciate what Peter's saying here. So I'm sure I'm gonna keep a lot of his critiques in mind as I sit down and work, work out the 10th edition of my principles book, which I'll probably start doing this spring. Um, because I, I, I learned, I mean, life is, I, I try to do the best I can based on what I know, but life is a learning experience. As I learn more, I try to make my books better. And I think they do get a little better in every edition. But would you then be open to open the committee of people to more people, say students that really want to develop the, the subject of economics and also have like burning questions of, for the future? I mean, that would be interesting for you, wouldn't it? Yeah, they had, they had you know, when I did the first edition of my principles book, they had uh, a student panel. They hired, they had, had students who were using this in manuscript form and gave me student feedback. Uh, and I worked with my editor taking into account the student feedback. And it, it tended to be less on, con- student feedback tended to be less on content, like what they want to cover or not. So the professors are better at judging that. And more on like, I don't understand this. This is not explained fully. It, it, it tended to be more um, comments and exposition than on content. Because I think a typical 18 year old is not, doesn't know enough to say, oh, you shouldn't present this topic, you should present that topic. That's the kind of stuff I get from professors. The professors are much more likely to make comments along those lines. Mm-hmm. But then it would be really interesting to also include the feedback of PhD students or master students because they know enough to say if something helped them to really understand more about economics or not. I think if you're already a professor and really like high level, yeah. um, then of course yeah. you have certain. Yeah, no, I hired. You know, when I did the first when I was working on the first edition of my principles book, actually both book, in both book. Now I think about it, I hired graduate students at Harvard. I mean, that, that's not obviously they may not be representative of the grad students in the world. I hired a, a small group of graduate students at Harvard to read through the manuscript with me. 
and give me um, give me give me feedback. And maybe I should do that again. I haven't I haven't done that since the first edition. That's we are very happy to provide you with uh, very interesting and <laughs> interested people to give you feedback you, and on a constructive I'm basis. I'm all, I'm all, people want to email me feedback, but especially the more specific, the better. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm always eager, always eager to hear. Thank uh, you. We'll okay. take your word for that. Great. <laughs> So I, I want to add, so if uh, we don't people, to... short, short, one short remark, if people have any feedbacks to my textbook, they're also very welcome because I agree with Greg, textbooks are evolving. And if I compare the fifth edition of my textbook with the first, it's a huge difference. And But it, they can only evolve if you really get these feedbacks, these suggestions. And so I invite everybody who maybe has used my textbooks already with all kinds of feedbacks because I, something I know for sure, my textbook is also not perfect. Uh, thank you. <laughs> coming to, to the end, um, and I, I very much encourage uh, Anna to send uh, comments in, in the summer, should it be, uh, to, to your next uh, edition of, the, of your textbook. And I would like to use the opportunity as a moderator to ask a question at the end, because tomorrow there will be a new president in the United States, Joe Biden. Um, and you have been uh, head of the Council of Economic Advisors in former times. Would you accept, if ever, I mean, there, has, there is someone uh, for this post, but would you accept to, to do this job for the Biden administration and for the program that they are offering? Um, well, I don't agree with all the program, but I, I, I think the team they put together is fantastic. The person who's taking the job that I had, Chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, is Cece Rouse. And she's, I've known Cece since she was a student at Harvard. So I've known her for many, many years. She's fantastic. She's great. Jenny Ellen, I've also known for many years, and she's also fantastic. So I think they have a really great economic team. If they called me and asked me to help, I, I, a, I believe in helping the, the government when they can. I don't expect that call to come, given that I worked for the other party. Um, but if they called me, I'd be perfectly happy to, to help them in any way I could. And you think that the, the program that is, uh, the program if ever, I mean, that's what- Well, you know, it's, I think some of it's well better than others. I, mean, I think obviously spending, spending, sending money to the states, spending money to spread the vaccine, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think the, the, the extra $1,400 they're sending to people, which is a large part of the pa fiscal package, is not very well targeted. So it's going to some people who need it, but not a lot of people who don't. I mean, for example, my two adult children, two, I have two adult children who are old enough to get these stimulus checks, which they, they have been enjoying, but they really don't need it. Um, so I think that the stimulus checks are not very well targeted. In fact, Larry Summers had an article which I posted on my blog uh, a couple of weeks ago about this. Um, so I, I, I think it's not a perfect package, but it's it's probably better than nothing. Many thanks, uh, Greg. Many thanks, especially to Peter for having um, thrown this uh, and, and started this discussion, which it seems is, is something which is very interesting and people like to discuss and there's a lot to, to continue to discuss and Anna will participate uh, in a way. And we'll participate in that uh, too. Thanks Rüdiger, thanks Anna, thanks Greg and, and Peter. Uh, enjoy the day and uh, hopefully we will overcome this corona crisis very soon and then have lively in-person debates and see each one again. Thanks a lot, bye bye. Thank you, thank, very you much. thank you, to Thank you, Thomas, for organizing this. It was really very, very useful. And let's maybe continue such a discussion, right? I yeah. mean, it's super useful. Why not? Yeah. I mean, it's not every day that we have this chance to exchange ideas. I would be up to it. Gregory, would you be up for it? Sure. You know, one of the, one of the great things about Zoom is you can connect with people without having to get on an airplane. True so I, I had, the technology was completely, I had never heard of, done this technology until the pandemic. And now I do it almost every day. So it's actually been great having to interact with people who I, I mean, Rudy, I used to interact with when he was a visitor at Harvard not very many years ago. But now I, I, we can interact on a regular basis, uh, even if we're not in the same, same city. Yeah, yeah, let's use it. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank Thanks, you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.